So now I'm going to talk about how to extract a trend in a cyclical component from a time series. I'm going to use some quarterly GDP data that I took from the FRED database. And then I'm going to first turn into log data. Then I'm going to extract the seasonal, or excuse me, the cyclical and the trend components using the Hodge Prescott filter. And then finally, I'm going to test for correlations between US and Mexican GDP. Right? So what I have here is quarterly data. I'll show you next. It's from the FRED database, but actually the FRED database will tell you that it's from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the OECD. And it's going to start in 1993, quarter one. It's going to go to the end of 2018. So I set my working directory to I um, because that's what I have. And yours will obviously be different. And then I've got this uh, US Mexico real GDP CSV file that I have. Um, it's already de seasonalized. I took it in that form from the FRED, uh, but it's real GDP. All right, and then we're going to look at it side by side as um, we first of all make our data series. Right, I always look at the head and then always look at the tail too, because this will show us the dates. Right, in the first quarter, 1993, you know, January, second, third, and fourth quarter. This is in billions of U.S. dollars because it'll be about nine trillion. At the end, it's about 18 and a half trillion. It goes, like I said, third quarter, 2018. Mexican GDP is actually in pesos, right? Trillions of pesos with 12 zeros at the end. But when we take logs, that's going to disappear. Right? So it's in different formats, but always know like what you're dealing with because you might find some weird result if you're not familiar with what your data are. Right, so we have our data here, and I'm going to rewrite it as a time series. We'll use the time series command. Take the second and third columns here. I'm going to start at 1993-1, and because it's quarters here, it'll know to read it as quarter one. If you left this off, it would actually do it as years, and it would go 103 years into the future. And so we, we, tell, we have to tell it it's quarterly. And then we're going to plot it using a simple plot. All right, so, oops, I erased that. Let's do that. When we have the data, right, you can see the time trend of real GDP. Um, similar in shape, right, different scale here. You can see the big uh, peso crisis of 1994 showing up as a recession in 95. And then here's the financial crisis for both. Right? And it looks like how GDP would look. It's growing over time, as you'd expect. All right, so the dates are already removed because I only took columns two and three. I'm going to take natural logs and make a new series that is log data. Remember, this is log base E. There's a separate command for log 10. And so we know it's the traditionally used uh, log E, which we always use in economics. All right, so I'm going to make ln data All right, as a new object here. You can see the scale is a little bit different. We're going to give it column names, US LNY for natural log and MX natural log Y. Um, and then we're going to look at the head and we will plot when the shapes are similar. The scale is different. If you zoom in, you can see that, uh, roughly speaking, the range is about 0.6 for both. So logs, if you don't, if you don't remember, remove what we call level effects, right? It doesn't matter if it's 12 trillion versus 9,000. Uh, the range is the same, and it actually corresponds to percentage changes. Right. So we have uh, the uh, new variable that's log transformed, and we look at the head, and you can see here that the Mexican numbers are higher, uh, but uh, the range is about the same. Right. So we're going to plot US data side by side so that we can see what it looks like. Um, my commands here, I make, I use the PAR, and then this is the uh, rows and columns. It's going to be one row, two columns. And at the end, I tell it to go back to one by one, because if you don't, it'll always draw a graph one at a time, expecting a second one over here. You kind of have to tell it to stop. All right. So I've got uh, my commands here, which is to plot the first column of data, which is the US in levels. And then the second, I'm going to do the first column of log data. And I'm going to do it uh, side by side. And remember, I usually do it with no labels. And I give each one their own header. You can see here in quotes. And this is what it looks like. Similar shape, different Y scale. But otherwise, they look pretty close to each other. Right. So this is our log transformed US GDP. So our big thing here is we are going to filter out the cycle from the trend. Now, there's a number of ways to do it, and there's controversy over all of them. I'm going to do the Hodrick Prescott filter, which is very well known. It's, it's often criticized. Some people say that you should use a different filter. Um, Baxter King, the bandpass filter, is sometimes used. I tend lately to use the Christiana Fitzgerald filter. Um, but for our purposes, any filter is fine. Some of the criticisms is against filters in general. They say, don't use any filter. Um, and there's even a paper called, Why You Should Never Use the Hodrick Prescott Filter. So I'm just going to use it, just kind of warn you that some people might not like it. Um, but it's good for our purposes. We're going to pull out the cyclical component. There's a package to do that. It's called M filter. It's some sort of miscellaneous filters. We're going to do the Hodrick Prescott filter. And, and there's a parameter you have to choose called lambda. Uh, and because we have four quarters, it's 1,600. And that's pretty common. If you have 12 months, it's 14,400. So it has to do with the square of the frequency. 
So I've got it installed, but I'm going to pull it in my library. And then I'm going to make a new object called USF, just US filtered. HP filter, first column of log data. I'm going to show you the head of it, and I'm going to show you what the cyclical component looks like. Now, if you um, just look at uh, USF at, at, at first, right, you're, you're going to see there's more to it than just the data. It's going to give us a number of different things in our output. We're going to just extract the cycle part of it. So we'll run that. You can see everything that comes out. It gives us title and name and call. But this is just the cycle part of it. You can see roughly, because it's not multiplied by 100, this is roughly half a percent. All right, this is kind of in percentage forms. All right, and so that's what we did. We used the, the Hodrick Prescott filter to pull out the uh, the cyclical component of the time series. There's also the trend component, which you can do here, right? Uh, but we mostly we just want the cycle. Well, we'll print the trend separately. Right. So we're going to make a plot. We're going to do first the cycle on the left, and then the data, which is our original data, with just the trend component. Those two together will be on the right over here. We're also going to have a zero line for the cycle to show us positive and negative cyclical movements. And then, of course, I change the colors and the fonts. So first I set it to be one row, two columns. Then I'm going to plot the cyclical part I just did with no labels and a title. to make it a little bit thicker. Then the AB line is going to give us any line of our choice. And here it's horizontal at zero. Type 3, which is a certain type of dash. Color, dark gray, we're going to make it thicker. Then this tells us to draw a new graph over on the right. And we're going to do two things. We're going to plot just the trend, again with no labels, a header here, trend plus cycle. We're going to set the limits of y, so it's between 9 and 10, which is sort of what we see here. And we're going to make it a little bit thicker and dark gray. Then the second part we're going to add with this command, new equals true, which means superimpose. And we're going to plot the first column of the log data, so, uh, or, which is basically the original series. And this, again, no labels. It's got to be the same limit. Otherwise, the lines won't they'll actually be drawn not on top of each other. And it's going to be a little bit thicker. And again, I always tell myself to go back to uh, my starting conditions so that I don't forget. All right, so here's my cycle. You can see the ups and downs. The US had booms and busts in the early 2000s, and the big boom and the bust around 2008. Over here, you can see this gray is the trend we extracted, which kind of slows. Right, and then picks up again. Um, some people will talk about how trend growth is smaller. Like, had the recession not happened, we'd be up here somewhere in terms of GDP. Or you can see it's lower. But here we're above trend. Here we're below in the recession. So that's one way to draw those graphs. All right. Now I'm going to quickly repeat for Mexico. I just copy my code. Just change a column, and you can see the cyclical component is roughly in the same range. All right. And so now I've got my two cycles. So I'm going to make a new object that is just the cyclical components, and it's going to combine or column bind the U.S. cycle and the Mexican cycle. And if I plot them side by side, then I can have, you can see that there's co-movement to some degree. They both go into recession together. But right here, the Mexico had a deeper recession than the U.S. Um, that, there's economic theory to that, right? And the big theory you could use to justify this is that the, because the Mexican economy is so tied to the U.S. through exports. The U.S. is booming. We buy a lot from Mexico. The U.S. goes into a recession. We stop buying from Mexico. So we can pull our economy up or down. And that will show up in a correlation. All right. So I've got these kind of drawn crudely. I didn't change any axes. And you can see why I kind of eliminate them. So I'm going to plot them together. So I make a new graph. I'm going to plot cycles one, which is the U.S., the first column. And I change the width, and I change the type, which is a solid line. And then I change, I mean, the first one is black. And I change my limits to kind of uh, have a little bit more space up and down. And I call it, you know, business cycles. P superimpose using new equals true. And I've got cycles two, which is Mexico. And again, the width might be the same, but the type is dashed. It's, this is a shade of gray. And I always make sure my labels and my limits are the same for both. Finally, I add my zero line here, and then I add a legend. I'm going to put it at the top right, and I'm going to have my titles, which again are a combination, right? Two, uh, two things in the object, and in quotes, U.S. Mexico. And then the line type matches, right? It's one and four, right up here, with two and two, which is over here. Colors are the same, so it's just exactly paired, right? When I do that, I get a nice graph over here. And you can see I've got. Um, these on top of each other. You can see that they do move together, and they particularly move together lately in the past decade or so. But the ups and downs go together. And that's kind of where these correlations might give us some, some statistical proof of this. All right. So now I'm going to test for correlations. The big thing we're going to do is this cross-correlation function, which actually looks at one variable's present value versus the other variable's present value 
and future values and past values. And you can see whether the, the waves, you know, the, you think of it like waves lining up, they're synchronized. You can think of cycles being synchronized if they're highly correlated at the same time, or being asynchronous if they line up with high correlations but at different times. Or they might have no correlation at all. So we're going to test not only the correlation between the series, but a cross-correlation, which gives it between times. And to do that, we have to understand leads and lags. All right, so we, a lagged variable is basically a past value, and a lead lead variable is the future. So here's just a thing I call LL1. I'll delete this later, but I'm going to take cycles one, which is US, right? It's the US business cycle. And then I'm going to take lagged US business cycle, which is basically going to make a variable where the past value, one quarter, one, one period lag, lines up to the present. And you can do things with this. You could run a regression called an auto regression to see if past values explain the future. You could do an auto correlation to see if present values are correlated with past values. Here, we're just going to use this as an example. So I'm going to make a variable, excuse me, I'm make an object that has present, remember this is 1993 quarter two. And my new variable has 1993 quarter one lined up with the second quarter. So this is second quarter, this is first quarter. This is lagged because the past value is exactly paired up with the present value. If you ran a regression, you would regress the present on the past. And because you can't go further back than your first observation, this is NA, this is not available. All right. So this is this is basically making a lagged variable. All right. If I do the now I'm gonna over here, I'm gonna add Mexico. If you do it for Mexico, I'm just gonna show you how the X and Y can look. So this is present Mexico. We're in the second quarter lined up with past U.S. So this is Mexico lagging the U.S. because the present is tied to the past quarter in the U.S. If you go the other direction, you could say the U.S. leads Mexico. That future U.S. is tied to present Mexican values. So we can calculate correlations for both lined up. You could do U.S. and Mexico in the present, but you can also do U.S. and Mexico quarters in the past and future. And usually with four quarters, we go four in the future and four in the past. Right, and so we're going to make a function with nine correlations: one in the present, plus four, minus four. Right. So first, I'm going to do this correlation to show you kind of what to expect. I'm going to have to omit NAs, and I'm going to take the correlation between col uh, columns two and three. And if I do that, you can see I've got my table, and the one I care about is 0.6829. Right. Now I'm going to round it to three values. Right. If you start in the middle, I'm going to take this NA omit. Right. The same columns. And I'm only going to do row two, column one, which is here. And then I'm going to round it to three. And so this is just extract just one number that I want. So it's 0.683. We're going to look for that. Because when you do cross correlations, it's really easy to forget which one's leading and which one's lagging. If you look at the numbers and know which direction it's going, that will tell you that x leads y, for example. All right, so the traditional command is not to do it manually like I just did. There's CCF, which gives you cross-correlation function with x cycles 1, y is cycles 2, lag max of 4, which again I said is going to be 4 leads and 4 lags. And if you do that, this is what it looks like, right? Now this is really 4 lags, but it's negative 1. If you multiply it by 4, you would get the 4 all the way to positive 4, so negative 4 to positive 4. You can see the highest value is right in the middle, and that shows that the two series are highly correlated. In here is about 0.68, but we don't know which one it is, which direction is which, so we're going to use the number just to make sure we're going the right direction. So this is the cross-correlation function. Sometimes it looks like an S for some variables, where it's negative and then it's positive. Sometimes it's a backwards S. Here it's just becomes positive right in the middle showing that the US and the Mexican business cycles are highly correlated. This is a significance band. Numbers higher than this blue line which was generated in the software, that is statistically significant. So they're all significant but they're highest here. Right? So I'm going to make my own object called CCF which does the same thing and then I'm going to extract just this ACF part and these are the numbers that correspond. So 0.72 and then here is 0.681 Right, which is a little bit off because it's calculated a little bit differently, but it is the number of the uh, this is this is the number of the the correlation that we calculated. Right, so we made the object CCF and we extracted those cross correlations. Right, it's centered at five, right, because it doesn't have the numbers yet. But if you go up, that's where X leads Y. So going up is where we showed where uh, the U.S. past values drove Mexican present values. All right, so I'm going to make a nice x-axis. It's going to be a combination of numbers that run from negative 4 to positive 4. And I could also do it by multiplying 4 times this number here, but I'm just going to do it that way. And, and then I, you see what I got? 
it is negative 4 to 4. Then I'm going to make a table that column binds this new axis with the values that I just showed you. I'm going to give it names, lag, and correlation. And then when you make the table, it looks like this. So this is going to be the table that I, we could, we, actually you could just make a table, which is compact and saves space, and it gives us the answer we want. The high, We know the highest correlation, and we know that they're synchronized, that they're highly correlated in the present. So that tells us something about the two economies, right? But you can also plot your own graph. I looked up in a table the 5% significance level for the 100 degrees of freedom. There's about 103 observations that we're working with. Because we cut them off with those lags, we make NAs, it's going to be a little bit different. But I looked it up and it's close. So first I'm going to plot my table as dots. With 20 is just a simple black dot, uh, or just a dot of any color. I'm going to make it black, um, or at least go to default. The X label is going to be leads and lags, lead slash lag in quotes. Y label is going to be correlation. We're going to change that. I'm going to make the limits between 0 and 1. It doesn't need to be negative. And then the title is what I wrote here. Then I make an AB line. I'm going to make a line here that is dark gray. It's a little bit thicker, but it's horizontal at the number I looked up in the table. And then finally, I connect the dots using the lines command. And so this is what I made myself. Okay. So again, you can see that it peaks, and that tests our theory. All right. So again, we used real GDP. It was already deseasonalized. We have a, a two-variable two database from Fred. I was able to take logs, and so then we have log real GDP for the U.S. and Mexico, and we extracted cycles for both using, using the Hydric Prescott filter. Finally, we looked at how closely they are connected. They're visually co connected, but with the stats you can prove it numerically, we see that they are connected, and so we proved a little economic theory. All right. Finally, as always, I write to a high-res JPG file, a JPEG, and I use the JPEG command here. Call it U.S. cycles. Again, I usually make them 3 by 5 inches with 300 dots per inch. So here I'm going to make it two columns, right? This is just a command to make the margins look nice. I played around until it worked. The axis, I changed the font size. The default is one, or minimum a little smaller. So first I plot the US cycle with no, uh, no labels here. I got a title, and then I've got a little bit of width. This, a lot of it looks like what I already did above. Make a second graph on the right. Again, I, I do the trend, and then I superimpose the original data series. Again, I choose colors. CX is font size, line type is the type of dash, etc. Finally, I go back and I reset my rows and columns. All right. None of this will show up here. Right? When I run this, it's actually writing to a drive. Okay. Same thing here. This is U.S. Mexican cycles. We, sh we show them on top of each other. Again, I made it a little bit bigger here so it could fit the legend. Right? But here's my legend down here. Everything else looks the same with, with the exception of just whatever tweaks you might have to make to make it look better once, once you print it. Because showing up here and showing up in your file does make a little bit different. You might have to change it. All right. Finally, I do that CCF graph I just did. It's, again, 3 by 5 and so forth. And then finally, I remove the variables that I didn't need anymore, the, these, these little uh, examples as well as the axis. So I'm going to remove those. But I printed three to my file. All right. And if you go here, or maybe not, here are the graphs I made. So you can preview them. Right. Here's the cross correlations. Not wanting to do it for me. All right. And here's the business cycle. Right, so I made three of these. You can see that there's room for the legend, etc. So you might have to play around with that. Right? But this kind of shows visually what, what we're getting at. Right? We're using log data. We took the cycles. Now we're looking at U.S. and Mexican economies do seem to move together, particularly here, which we could test further. But these are highly connected economies. Right? So visually, we were able to plot the cycles, but the CCF showed us what the... Um, what mathematically was the highest correlation. Right? So, so that's, that's what we're able to do using uh, business cycle extraction and, and cross-correlations to prove this economic hypothesis.